If you, if you were wondering what my music was, it was Huey Lewis in the news. Good. Um, thank you so much. So yeah, I'm Kyle Nell, and I run, I started and run the Lowe's Innovation Labs. Has anybody heard of us or the robot, seen the robots? Anybody watch John Oliver? We were on there. It's really funny. I would watch it. Ron Swanson is my, my personal hero. So that was, that was, I pretty much peaked. I told my wife, I'm like, well, it's time to switch to a different career. Maybe we'll raise alpacas or something. Um, so anyways, I'm going to talk to you. Has anyone heard about the Lowe's Innovation Labs or the robots? Can I ask you if I could raise a hand? No, no one. Oh, awesome. This is great. Okay. So we'll talk about what we do, why I exist, and why they uh, continue to let me do this stuff. So first I want to talk about why we um, have this Innovation Labs group. And um, so I'm a neuroscientist by training, so forgive the, the chart here, but I promise this will be the only one. Um, so change in time. So this is the world in which we operate. And uh, what, what I call this over here is the linear path to doom. And what you have is really smart, not Enron, but really smart, hardworking people um, constantly improving their product or service. And that's great. Like, not everyone should do what I do. The company would be in shambles. Um, but you can't just keep focusing on improving your product because something, because we, we don't live in a linear world. We live in an exponential world. Um, and because we live in that exponential world and because these exponentialities are happening faster and faster and the variables that are building into these models that make up our life are compounding on each other in more and more uh, different and hard to predict ways, um, you can get wiped out if you're not in the forefront. I mean, ask Blockbuster. Um, all of the funny quotes about the internet that have been going around with, from Katie Couric and the Today Show and all those things, because we just don't think linearly. I can, I can tell you that is a fact. And so Kodak, Blockbuster, all of these cautionary tales, um, they didn't see it coming at all. It seems so obvious now, but they didn't see it coming. So if you leave with one thing from today, I hope that you realize, if you didn't already, that we live in an exponential world. And if you are thinking that you don't live in this exponential world and you've got to figure it figured out, you're more on the linear path to doom <laughs> than, than you probably should be. So, so just this is the basis for why we do this stuff. The old way of predicting the future was, uh, to, from a corporate strategy standpoint, was to have a scenario planning or a defensive mechanism, right? Like the old shell scenario planning, like what if we live in a world with no oil? What are we going to do? Um, that's all well and good, but once again, because of this exponential curve that we're on, that's really hard to predict how and in which ways um, things will converge. So I'm going to talk about how we predict the future and then how we build on it. But it's really important to, to believe that we're in an exponential world. Does everyone believe that? All right. All right, great. And then the other part of this, too, is that we live in a deceptive world of innovation, right? So what happens is you have this stuff that pops out. And much like VR in the 90s, virtual reality in the 90s, um, you have these like really clunky systems. And then there's like, oh, it doesn't really work the way we wanted it to. And then it becomes deceptive, and people kind of forget about it. But meanwhile, there's like this core group of people that are building and working on it. And then all of a sudden, it takes off and becomes the thing, right? Um, so we understand there's a deceptive point, a disappointing part of the innovation cycle. And that's important to keep in mind as well. So when we work, we work with partners, long-term partners, because we need to bridge that gap from the idea and the promise to reality. Cool. And then on the flip side of that is once we overcome the deceptive part, we hit this amazing opportunity where it starts to pick up at this tremendous speed, right? Like virtual reality was really nowhere a couple of years ago. Now everyone's talking about it all the time. HoloLens, our HoloRoom, uh, Oculus, and all that good stuff where it wasn't even anywhere a few years ago. And we're right there, guys. It's exciting. So there are two big problems with dealing with uh, corporate innovation or even organizational over uh, um, innovation. And one is opportunity overkill. And first, let me just kind of define how I see innovation or how we see innovation. Innovation is like the word natural. It's like the most overused word um, probably in business. And so it's been, it's been overused to the point where it's not even doesn't even mean anything. Um, innovation for us means something that is what most people would call disruptive innovation. The other stuff I would call improvement. And that's really important. And I don't want to minimize that. That's really important to improve your product or service. But that's not what innovation is. Innovation, for me, is something that's big, something that's like iPhone big, or something like shocking that will change your behavior. So the real question is, with all of the stuff you can do in your organization, all the stuff we could do in our organization, what do we do? So it becomes this opportunity overkill. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with a story. Anybody know what happened on this date with this man here? 
Yes? It wasn't a good day for him. What, what happened, anybody? Assassinated, right? Okay, so this was, this was kind of a big thing, right? Um, many, 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 many theories were sprung up about this. There was one question, who shot the president, right? That was what everyone was trying to figure out. People are still trying to figure it out. There are amazing conspiracy theory blogs about it. I highly recommend reading it. They're hilariously fascinating. Um, and so, so I liken the opportunity to overkill to this. For us, and I think for most companies too, is like how do we do X? There's one core question. How do we grow? How do we make more money? All of those things is one core question, but in the mess, it's really hard to figure out what to do or even what that cause is. So let me just, I'm gonna use this example as a way of showing how absurd uh, your strategy can get if you're not thinking about it in the right way. So this is from the famous film of, uh, of the JFK assassination. There was one guy, this is in Dallas, Texas. You know, it's, it's, it's uh, fall, but it's Texas, so it's a nice, bright, sunny day. Everyone else is wearing like regular clothes. There happens to be this one guy standing outside in, this, in, this, in the uh, sun with an umbrella and a three-piece suit on and a heavy black overcoat. And has anyone heard of the Umbrella Man before? Anybody? One person? All right, all right, we'll be friends later. Um, so this guy uh, is in this film and everyone, th there was a, a lot of energy like generated like what is this guy? Who is this guy? What did he do? There were entire books written about him. He was, it's called The Umbrella Man Theory. I, I highly recommend looking it up. It's hilarious. And there were, in this book and other books, they really believed that he was the second shooter, that this guy was this like, expert marksman, and then he had, like, created this rifle that would shoot through the umbrella and somehow was able to catch the president who was moving in a vehicle. From, it's just ridiculous. But they really believed that. And it wasn't until a journalist from the New York Times found the guy that was actually um, wearing, wearing the clothes, and he didn't kill the president. It's pretty plain to see. What he was doing was that he was protesting JFK's father, who was good old buddies with Chamberlain, and he blamed them for creating what ended up becoming the next world war. Um, and so because Chamberlain would famously wear a, uh, a black three-piece suit and a, uh, an umbrella, that was his way of protesting. That somehow, like, President Kennedy was going to come by and go, oh, zing, ah, you got me. Oh, and I'll have to call dad later. Oh, man, that got me. And so, so like, it seems so ridiculous, but this one anomal anonymous, uh, anomalous event caused all this work and all of this stuff that ultimately distracted from who killed John F. Kennedy. Who killed him? So we have the same, same issues. Um, you have the entire world looking at this and trying to figure this out still to this day. Um, and it seems so simple, but it's actually quite hard. There's so much noise. What is, what is the real problem? What is not? What should we be focusing our energy on? What should we not? And I'll talk about how we get over that problem of, of opportunity overkill or too much noise. The second problem is Newton's first law. Anybody know what Newton's first law is? An object that... Unless, unless what? Specifically an unbalanced force, right? So we, we actually call ourselves, the, my, my team, we call ourselves the unbalanced force. So the idea is that an object in motion or an object at rest tends to stay at rest or in motion unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. So I don't know about your organization, but mine, it likes to keep going the way it's going, right? And customers and people, we, we, we're habit. We're creatures of habit, right? Everyone's heard of behavioral economics. That works because we're irrational and we just keep going, right? In the path that we usually do. And organizations, corporations, I know Mitt Romney famously said corporations are people, but he was kind of right because there was all, this was like group zeitgeist that manifests itself as like one coherent unit and the organization almost seems to take on a life of its own. And so Newton's first law, how do you overcome this? So my biggest problem in my career has always been amazing presentations that I spent all this time and effort building and I knew I had the answer and everyone was like, Kyle, that was amazing. And then nothing happened. Has anyone had that problem before? An amazing presentation that went nowhere? There's nothing more frustrating. I would have rather walked out and they're like, you're an idiot, get out of here, we're calling security, than like, great job, I love it, changed my life. Nothing happened. So in my frustration with great meetings that went nowhere, I started working through these two problems, opportunity overkill 
and then uh, overcoming Newton's first law. Does anyone have these similar problems in their organization where people are trying to convince? I hope so, or else I would like to work with you. Okay, so this is how we do it. So we use a process, uh, modified process that we call science fiction prototyping. Has anyone heard of that before? All right, this is great. Okay, so science fiction prototyping, um, basically what we do, this is a reductionist view of how this works. We give all of our marketing research, all of our trend data and other things to professional published science fiction writers. The reason we do that is they're uniquely qualified to be able to figure out possible futures of how these trends and technologies could, might converge, right? So um, I don't really care about the trend about this thing or VR or that thing. I care about how that might converge with a, with a societal trend or a people trend and, and actually change someone's behavior or life. So I think a good way to explain it is science predicted the car, science fiction predicted the traffic jam. I'm interested in solving traffic jam problems, not car problems. Does that make sense? And I know that you guys are in the traffic jam business as well, right? How do all these things aggregate together and how does that influence lot people's lives? So we went, in my, once again, in my frustration with great meetings that went nowhere, I started you know, thinking differently. And so what we did was I uh, hired these guys, they wrote short stories, these are real stories with characters and narrative and conflict, and then we turned those into comic books. And the reason we did that is because it suspends disbelief a little bit, right? You ever sent somebody like a really mean email in like a funny font? Um, it's like, oh, well, they're like mad, but like what? I don't, am I fired? But it's like in Comic Sans, so like <laughs> it can't be that bad. It was the same kind of thing with this. So I, we can show it to you in a little bit, but. So like th this was part of the real comic book. Obviously we don't have the whole thing because it's a strategic document. But I literally was like, all right, all right, CEO, we're gonna read a bunch of comic books and then we're gonna talk about what this means and what, how these technologies might converge and then um, afterwards you're gonna tell me which story to make real. And he was like, okay. So we literally read these comic books and then those are our strategic documents and then he said, Kyle, go make this happen. So we did and that was the Hollow Room. So the Hollow Room exists, it's in two stores in Canada and it's actually throughout the Canadian uh, chain online. Um, and what it is is a virtual reality and augmented reality store where you can design your bathroom, right now it's just bathrooms, you can design your bathroom and it's real Lowe's products that you can buy. It tells you the list, it has the paint colors, the floor, the backsplash, everything. And then you can walk around inside of your space and see what that would actually look like. Um, pretty cool, anyone done a remodel? It's like not the most fun thing ever. There are actual marital therapists that, I'm serious, that all they do is remodels gone awry. When you have an entire vertical of therapists that specialize in that, you know you have uh, some, some, uh, some head space there that you can fix, right? And so we actually called this the marriage saver early on. And this was a comic book, and what the comic book allowed us to do was gave us a lot of space. So instead of like, well, Kyle, how's that going to happen? No one's ever built this. We did this story right like two weeks before uh, Oculus went on Kickstarter. Two weeks. So at the time, no one was talking about VR. No one was talking about AR. And, and uh, it gave us that space. I, no one asks me how questions. They just, I just show them pictures of what we're trying to build, which is really great because there's no point in talking about technical issues. It talk, it's, a, it's important to talk about outcomes. Does that make sense? Okay. So very quickly, we iterate very, very fast. And we went from story to framework, and then we tested very quickly inside the store until ultimately we got to what we have inside the store. And we're even continuing to iterate right now. Um, this is the one of the stores in Canada right now. Um, and I can, I'll explain, I can go through it later um, in the breakouts and tell you exactly how it works, but it's really cool. Um, it's another thing there, but for time's sake, I won't do that. And what we did was we make announcements. So we announced live on CNBC, and I, I won't uh, show you the video because we don't have time. But we had a ton of response. Initially, when we were like, Lowe's is coming out with something cool, people were like, yeah, another color hammer, and like nothing, they weren't, they didn't, uh, didn't get a lot, of, uh, a lot of respect initially. But then when we, when we came out, people were really like, whoa, I can't believe Lowe's is building it. Why? Because we live in an exponential world where it's harder and harder to predict who's gonna come out with the next platform. Who would have ever thought that Lowe's would be the one to come up with the first virtual reality and augmented reality store? Probably no one, uh, probably not me, a couple of years ago. Um, and the response was very big, as you can see here. We were actually, we were at CES and we got named as one of the top, uh, top tech at CES, for all CES, right? So who, who, would, who would do that, right? Um, and I won't, I won't show this to you, but you guys can take a look at it later. It's really my dream come true. Uh, you don't need to hear that. Uh, it's some I'm a narcissist, so I, I make sure that I'm in every single video, if you can't tell. <laughs> uh, 
It's awesome. OK, so this was our live at CNBC. I'm wearing the same jacket. Yes, I know. Um, <laughs> and uh, anyways, so, so we were live on CNBC. It looks almost like an advertorial. And once again, because it was so different, people were shocked and it was compelling. So New York City, where Lowe's just we, announced a new. And we, we can, you guys can watch that later. But it, the response was really overwhelming. Um, and then w the cool thing about it, too, is we started to get a lot of inbounds from people that normally would never talk to us or consider us in that like cool set of where I could give my cool stuff to. And it started to open up the windows of possibilities. So we have an, a view, and we're working with stuff that's not been announced yet by anybody. And we're working at early, early stage. That would have never happened had we not put ourselves out there, right? And it's risky and scary, but it, but it allows us to do that. So we're getting better at this whole science fiction prototyping to real life stuff. And the, the next example is the robots. So I think a couple more people saw the in-store robots. No? Probably not. Wow. You guys are in media, right? OK. Anyways, so, um, so this was a story like the other. Um, but this time, we got better at it. This, w this was a story in January. The basic idea is that retail has not changed, really, in the past couple hundred years. You go to a store, you have an idea what you want, you think that they have it, the people in the store probably have a better idea of what the thing is that you're interested in buying. They give you a little bit of advice, you're like, hmm, hmm, okay, maybe I'll buy it, and you buy it and you walk out. The only thing that's really changed right now is that there might be a self-checkout, and you might use a credit card. That's not a really substantial change to, to, the, to the whole model. And then there are still some core problems um, that are inside of uh, stores, right? Has anyone been to like a large warehouse store lately, like a Lowe's? It's great because everything's there, but it's hard at the same time. Um, so we wanted to solve some of these problems. So this was the story. This is a cleaned up version, so we don't share everything that we have future plans. But this was a story, like I said, in January, and we went from scratch. Um, this didn't exist. There was a robotic startup that was doing telepresence. Um, we worked with them, and then we launched inside of the store in, in October. And I we work to, with there you groups go. We do. and we We definitely work with them. And, um, <laughs> and so this is what it is. The robot wa rolls up to you. It says, hi. This is an orchard, which is out here out west. Um, but we own them. We own orchard. It rolls up to you. It says, hi. Um, I'm the Oshbot. Can I help you find something? And you just talk to it. You can talk to it in Spanish. You can talk to it in Cantonese. You can talk to it in other languages as well. And you, and you just talk to it like you normally do. Remember when Nintendo first came out and everyone was trying to make Mario jump? Everyone was like this. Right, it's the same kind of thing. People just want to talk to stuff. They don't want to download an app. They, don't, they just want to like, talk to stuff. And the robot will talk back to you in a nice way, of course. And then it will, um, it will show you the exact real-time location of every single object we have inside the store. And it will tell you if, and if we have the thing you're looking for. And it will actually navigate you to that thing. And while it's going through, because of the beacon stuff and because it knows where it is inside the store, it will send you relevant information on the back of the screen. You guys can see the. Uh, the videos later. Um, also, too, it's collecting a ton of information. Think about this one basic thing. We don't know what people want when they come inside the store. Like, isn't that crazy? Like, we don't know. Um, this collects that and also collects the language that in which they asked it. That alone, I think, would be worth the project. The other thing is on the top, it has a 3D depth sensing camera. And so, you know, people come with like a random screw or hinge. You can hold it up, it'll tell you exactly what it is and if we have it inside the store and if not, where you can get it instead of wandering around forever. Um, and we were able to do that, why? Because we had built the hollow room and we had a 3D scanning factory that we built from scratch. So it's this convergence of stuff that makes it harder and harder to, to duplicate or compete because we have, we're building out these systems. And a ton of other stuff that won't run over any kids. We've tried it. Um, it's great. Um, we, this one, I was like, man, how are we going to beat the hollow room? This one was like off the charts. We had like a ton of articles. I think we're almost up to 200,000 YouTube views. And we were on the Today Show all morning. It was hilarious. If you don't want to be nervous, try to have a robot, hack a robot, to talk to Al Roker live on television. That was kind of nerve wracking. But uh, it went really well. And we had a ton of new leads. We were also um, famously uh, on uh, John Oliver. And he wasn't making fun of the robot. He was talking about how difficult home improvement is, like going through that process, which we completely agree with. And Ron Swanson would happen to be the guy. So it was pretty awesome. Um, and a ton of positive stories. We really didn't have, there's obviously a possibility of having something uh, negative there, but there really wasn't um, because people are excited about that. So I'm out of time, but if I leave it with you again, who would think that Lowe's would come out with the first 
automate, fully autonomous robot, speaks all these languages, has all this stuff. Who would think that Lowe's would have the first VR and AR store? And I can tell you what's coming out soon is just as far apart as robots and VR are from other things. Um, because we live in an exponential world and it's hard to predict. So the only way to get out and to, and to, to build your company or build your structure um, or future is to build it um, and get out there in front. So that's, that's my message. Thank you, I'm gonna be around somewhere. Okay. <clears throat> Thank yes. you guys. You're gonna be outside in 20 minutes leading